you. Well, thanks, Stan. Good evening, everyone, young people, mums and dads. So before we begin, we're going to talk about theistic evolution. If you've never heard of that, that title or that idea before, don't worry, I'll tell you all about what it means and how it affects the ecclesia. But before we begin with that, here's a, here's a picture of my family, because Stan mentioned I had, I had five daughters. This is my, oh, how do I do this? This is my wife, Anna, here. She is from Adelaide, Australia, which is now why we live in Adelaide, Australia. So we're living where she grew up. My eldest daughter, Sarah, is 20. Joanna is 18. Rebecca is 15 and a half. Laura's 12. Jess is 10. So 20 years old, 10 years old, so I've got five kids in 10 years. Uh, Sarah and Joe. This one here, number one and number two, they're now both working. The other three are all at school. So, in oh, fact, Jess's birthday, this one here, was only about a month ago, so I've now got no children with single digit ages. So, the family is really sort of moving on. And I'm guessing in five years' time, I won't even have them all at home, I suppose. So, if Christ hasn't come by then. So, that's how things look. This was. This actually was taken, oh, you know, we said before everybody leaves home and goes and does things or shifts countries, whatever they might do, let's quickly at least get some family photos because we're not really good at... In order to do this, as it turns out, when you've got daughters, you've got to go and buy dresses and buy dresses that match and the dad's got to have a shirt that's blue that matches the blue dresses, but you can't all be blue, you've got to have some pink in there or some other colour that complements that, but you can't have any colour. Blah, blah, blah. In order to get a family photo like this, it requires a fair amount of preparation, so we don't do it very often. It's obviously a lot more expensive than just the photo. So we thought, look, you've got to do it sometime. This was actually taken on Brian Luke's farm. You, Brian Luke, you may know. He's got a, a, like a little farmlet. He's a sort of hobby farm with a few cows and that's all. But his daughter, Verity, is a, a bit of an ecclesial photographer. She does weddings and that kind of thing in the spare time. So she came and, and took the photos for us which is why it ended up being there. <clears throat> theistic evolution. What is theistic evolution? Well, evolution all began, at least in, in modern history, with Charles Darwin. In 1859, Charles Darwin published a book called Origin of the Species, in which he proposed a new model for the development of complex life forms. Now, the idea of evolution has always, well, sort of, almost always existed. The Greeks believed it in the days of Socrates, 300 BC. And so Darwin did not invent the idea of evolution, or the idea that one animal could come from another animal. He didn't invent the idea. What he invented, if you like, was the model. So people had always sort of thought that this was a possibility, but creationists still had a fairly good argument against them because the scientists never really could say, well, how did it actually occur? What Darwin, his, if you like, uh, major contribution to the field of, of evolutionary science was to provide the model, which was basically the method by which evolution could occur. And for those of you who are a little older, what that simply meant was that he, he proposed that by, by natural selection, one org uh, organisms better suited the environment would supersede organisms who were less suited to their environment and one organism would change from another by genetic mutation. So that's basically that's what that, that is essentially where Darwin got to. And that was a it's not right, but it was plausible, and, and that's where evolution has now gone. When you talk about evolution, you've got to think about this in terms of three major groups of people. And here they are here. We've got evolutionists, we've got creationists. And we've got theistic evolutionists. That's what I'm going to talk about this evening. What do evolutionists believe? Well, when you talk about evolution and life on Earth, you've got two problems to solve. The first problem is, number one, where did life come from? If we assume that 5,000 million years ago, the Earth was just um, a, a lifeless orb in the universe, at some point, life had to begin. So the first question the evolutionist has to answer is, how did it begin? What happened? And then the next question he has to answer is, and how did you get from that simple beginning to complex human beings as we are today? 
So you see, there's two very different questions. Now, the evolutionists really don't care about how it began, because we're all guessing, or they're all guessing. Uh, Darwin's contribution in the, in the research that's done by evolutionists, evolutionary scientists today is how did it become increasingly complex? What the evolutionists say, however, to those two questions are, where did life come from? Answer, spontaneous generation. Maybe a, a bolt of lightning hit the sea and created some amino acids and they come together and they made an organism somehow. They just say, it just happened spontaneously. But having now uh, created life, we've now, we, we now make life more and more and more complex until we get complex li uh, life forms like us. And that happens, as I've said there, by natural selection. Simple organisms become diverse and more complex by the natural selection of beneficial genetic mutations. So that's how evolutionists basically describe their business. Against them are creationists, which is us. And we say, that's all uh, nonsense. Where did life come from? Answer, miracle. God created it. Pretty simple. One step process. And how did, uh, how did complex life forms get developed? Miracle. Easy. God created everything all at once in the first six days of creation. That's all that happened. None of this evolution stuff. So you can see we've got, we've got evolutionists in the red there, we've got creationists in the blue, and then we've got a group in the middle. And that group in the middle says this, and these are theistic evolutionists. So theistic, theos means God, and evolutionist is evolution. So a theistic evolutionist is somebody who says that God works by evolution. And the theistic evolutionist says, Life began by a miracle, but complex life forms have come by evolution. So what they simply say is that God started the process and evolution took over after that. Or if you like, God has used evolution. In fact, I've got a quote down the bottom there from a brother in Melbourne who believes in theistic evolution, who, if he carries on, won't be a brother for all that much longer, I think. But his the definition of theistic evolution is this, is the acceptance that, bi that biological evolutionary theory as formulated by Darwin has been found to be correct and is therefore clearly a mechanism that God employed for his own creative purpose. So we've got Christadelphians saying that. And you can see they've taken part of the theory of evolution and part of creationism and stuck them together and made it theistic evolution. So they've got to bet both ways. Now, why would somebody want to do that? Why would, why would you try and even think that? I mean, you're either an evolutionist or you're not. Well, the answer is because they look at the, at the geological column, which is the, uh, the description evolutionists have of, of, of life and the age of life forms, and they say, well, we've got life, we've got bones of dinosaurs, which we think are 200 million years old. Adam only lived 6,000 years ago. If we say that dinosaurs were alive at the time of Adam, or if we say that we've got bones of men that are 200,000 years old, we're going to have an explanation to answer that. Well, we're going to use evolution to answer it. And we're going to say that the scientists are right when they date, when they date bones. And therefore, Adam wasn't 6,000 years ago. He was much longer ago than that. But we still want to use Genesis 1, because we, if we disagree with that, then we disagree with the Bible. We're, we're not... We're not believers anymore, so we're going to try and stitch those two ideas together and make up this intermediate idea called theistic evolution. How do you answer that, by the way? How do you answer the issue that perhaps the, we do have bones that are more than 6,000 years old, perhaps bones of men that are more than 6,000 years old, and or bones of dinosaurs? How do we answer that problem? Well, you've got two choices. Either the bones really aren't 200 million years old at all, but the scientists have got their dating methods wrong. That is actually, I can talk to you more about that later, but that's entirely possible. And the reason I say that's entirely possible is because, think about, think about all the, how, how many people have ever lived in the history of the world? Well, hundreds of, well, hundreds, tens of billions of people, I suppose. How many fossils do we have of all those people? All, a small fraction, a very small fraction. What's the point? The point is, fossils are only ever formed in unusual circumstances. 
People who know, who, who die and get buried, they don't become fossils, they just disintegrate into dust. You only form fossils in unusual circumstances. But one of the basic um, ideas of, of dating is that it's got to be at a steady state. It, it, everything's got to be in equilibrium. You can't have catastrophes and chaoses occurring. In order to date things, we're going to presume that the the, let's say, carbon-14 dating. We're going to presume that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere today is the same as it was back then, and if there's a different level of, level of, of this isotopic carbon in bones uh, because of radioactive decay, we, we're going to do a calculation to work at how old they are. Well, that assumes that everything's always been constant. My point is, fossils are never formed when circumstances are constant. They're always formed in catastrophe. So uh, the very existence of the fossil actually defies the theories which are then created to date it. So my first, my first point is fossils actually may not be as old as you think they are. The second possibility is that those fossils may be as old as you think they are, but they're from a previous creation. And uh, it's not a man at all. It might be a monkey of some kind. It could be anything. But one of those two options is entirely possible. Either the bones aren't as old as you say, or they are as old as you say, but they predate Adam. So there, there are other reasons that you could, or other explanations you could give, even for what scientists think they've discovered, without fiddling around with what the Bible actually says. Okay. In 1941, Brother Ralph Lovelock wrote this uh, article in the Christadelphia magazine. And in it, he said, this, very, this is a very enlightening um, explanation of what God uh, wants from us. The word of God, he said, is not intended by its author to convince a man against his will. What's, what he, what's he saying? He's saying, God is not going to force you to become a Christadelphian. God is not going to force you to believe the truth. Strong desire to comprehend the things of God must be felt before it is possible to follow the thread. And the word is so designed that scoffers are given a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So if you're a skeptical Bible student, if you're anything other than a serious Bible student, you may well be thrown off the track of the truth of the Bible. So think about this, the Catholics, for example. Uh, they believe that the Pope's infallible when he speaks from the bishop's chair. But they believe in miracles. They believe in... Uh, uh, patron saints, they believe in the immortal soul, they believe in the devil, they believe in the trinity, they believe in all these sorts of things. And they think they can prove all of that from the Bible. Listen, that's the same Bible that you use, and you think you can prove exactly the opposite. What's gone wrong? Well, they're not serious Bible students. Well, God has written the Bible in many places in code, and therefore, people who aren't serious students will get tripped up by the code and they'll believe something opposite to what the truth is and think that they've got Bible truth because they haven't been serious. And they're trying to weave into it other theories. So the Catholics have a, have a set of doctrines which are logical. They just have to be wrong. But they are logical. They're not, they're not fools. And nor are the Pentecostals, the Anglicans, or anybody else you see. Come with me to Isaiah 66. I'll, I'll just give you two more quotes on the subject. I'm going to give you Isaiah 66 and Isaiah 44. And, and the reason I'm showing you these is because both Old and New Testament tells you that unless you're serious about what the Bible says and, and, and read it... Uh, in its own right, without trying to include other ideas, you will be thrown off the track because God says, I'm deliberately going to mislead you if you're not serious about what I'm saying. Isaiah 66, verse 3. He that killeth an ox is, 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 is as if he slew a man. So God's saying, what he's basically saying here is that... The, the sacrificial animal, God, God regards people who slay a sacrificial ox as if he offered a man. Like, he, these, uh, in Isaiah's day, the uh, people of Jerusalem were making various sacrifices, and, and God was so disgusted with their conduct that he says, you might as well offer human sacrifice to me. Um, he even sacrifices a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. 
He that offers an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burns incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. He says, your sacrifices disgust me, because I know that you're only really serving yourself. You're not serving me. I will, I, he says, I also will choose their delusions, and will bring their fears upon them. Because when I called, none did answer. So I look for a relationship with you, he says. You weren't interested. You were only interested in doing what you wanted to do. Therefore, I'm going to bring your delusions upon you. So you're going to, you're going to think that the spirits exist. But well, I'm going to let you think that. And I'm going to write my words so that you can read it. And you might find a verse here or a verse there that seems to prove what you think. And so now you believe in the devil. Because you're not consistent. And so you can see what he's saying. God says, I, I will, I will allow your own deluded thoughts to become your doctrines if you're not serious Bible students. But it's the first one. Come to Isaiah 44. Here's another one. What happens if that, if that goes on? Before long, you believe false doctrines about, uh, out of the Bible and you won't even know. You can't even tell that they're false. So Isaiah 44 verse 19. Have a look at this. So the story of Isaiah 44, of course, is about a man who goes into the forest, he chops down a tree, and uh, he cuts the first half off it, and he chops it into firewood, and he makes the fire, and he cooks, and cooks his baked beans, and then with the second half of that same tree trunk, he carves the face, and he carves some arms and some legs, and he bows down, and he worships it. It's the same tree trunk. The first half he used as, as wood for the fire, and the second half he worshipped, and he thinks it's a god. You say, it's the same tree trunk. How, can we, how, how, how would he know that he didn't burn the God part and he's worshipping the firewood? How would he know? Well, look, nine, verse 19. And none considers in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I've burned part of it in the fire, yea, also I've baked bread upon the coals thereof, I've roasted flesh and eaten it, and shall I make the residue thereof, that is, shall I make the rest of the tree an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock or the trunk of a tree, like to worship? He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? And what that's saying here is he's got, on his right hand side, he's got this tree trunk, or half of a tree trunk, whatever's left, and he's falling down and worshipping it, and now, because he's so deceived, he can't tell that there's a lie on his right-hand side. He can no longer tell the difference between truth and error. Because he has persisted in believing error, God has allowed him to believe error, and now he can't tell the truth, even if he tries. What's the point? The point is, back to here, God's not going to make you believe what the Bible actually says. If you want to believe that the Bible says something different to what it actually says, because you've got a preconceived idea or a different theory of man that you want to weave into these pages, God will allow you to believe that. If you persist, the time will come when you can't see any other meaning but the meaning that you've put on those words. The time will come when you, at some point, can't even come back to the truth because you're so convinced about evolution or whatever it might be. And I've shown you that from the Old Testament. 2 Thessalonians 2 says that strong delusion, they should believe the lie. That's a quote from 2 Thessalonians 2. It's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. God says, hey, you've got to take this book seriously. It's my book, not yours. And the minute you fall around with it, I will lead you astray. So that's the point. Now, let me tell you a story. See this brother here? Brother Ralph Lovelock. Ever, have you ever heard of Brother Ralph Lovelock? Anybody ever heard of him? One person's heard of him. Now, he's a little bit before your time and mine. He's dead now, of course. Died in, I think, 1997. Well, in 1966, or 1965, Brother Ralph Lovelock ran a... He was from London. He ran a series of classes at a local ecclesia in London on the origin of man. And this is what he taught that there was a race of humanoid creatures that existed in the world prior to Adam. 
They were human in all respects, but they were ignorant of God. So we've got a race of humanoids, we'll call them. And they exist before Adam existed. Where did they come from? If Adam's the first man, where did these fellas come from? Evolution. Adam was formed from them. We're not told how, but he became their representative. God gave Adam the powers of leadership, of long life, and of a knowledge of the truth. Adam sinned, however, and was expelled from the Garden of Eden to die. But he taught the truth to the humanoids, and they became men. Now, you, you, you have to think about how that works. We've got these, presumably these animal creatures, who, as soon as they learn the truth, they become men, like morally accountable. And at least the sinners could reproduce with them. What that would mean today, if that was true, is that you and I are either descendants of Adam and Eve, or two humanoids, or a human and a humanoid. That's what. Now let me tell you about Brother Ralph Lovelock. He was an arranging brother of the Watford Ecclesia. Harry Tennant was in the Watford Ecclesia. At Watford Ecclesia, he was at AV at the same time as Brother Ralph was. He was a member of the CMPA. Do you know what the CMPA is? Chris Delphian Magazine Publishing Association. He was on the Chris Delphian Magazine Committee. What's the point? He was a heavy hitter. He wrote a lot of articles in the Chris Delphian Magazine. He was an AB of a reasonably major ecclesia in London. And he was on the Chris Delphian Magazine Committee. And he went and he ran a series of classes at the Caxton Hall Ecclesia on the origin of man, and he taught this in his classes. And this is what happened. In the fourth quarter of 1964, Caxton Hall Bible classes, Brother Ralph Lovelock did a series on the origin of man. Subsequently, he published the notes because people wanted to see what he was really saying. So he, he, he published the notes on it. In April 1965, letters to the editor started to flow into the Chris Elby magazine. And Brother Lovelock clarified his beliefs in a letter to the editor. In May 1965, the notes were advertised on the back cover of the Chris Delphian magazine. If you've got old Chris Delphians, you'll find the notes advertised for sale on the back cover of the magazine. In August 1965, letters start flooding in. Now, Brother Lou Sargent, LG Sargent, was the editor of the Chris Delphian magazine at this time. Here's an example of one of the letters that the arranging brethren like these are, are, are ecclesias around the world now starting to write to the, to the editor of the Chris Delphine magazine. Dear Brother Sergeant, greetings. This is from East Coventry, Ecclesia. This is a, a pretty sad story, I've got to tell you. I mean, this is a, I'm giving you all these facts. This is a brother in the truth, a responsible brother in the truth, who started to go astray on evolution. I'm going to show you what happened. Well, this is the beginning. We accept the wisdom of the Chris Delphian Magazine's com committee's plea for patience and calm in the present position. So the magazine's trying to keep the lid on things so they can deal with it and find out what this brother really is teaching and does he really believe it? And if we push him, and can we, can, can we convince him he's wrong? Where, where exactly do we stand? Because he's a responsible brother. At the same time, however, this arranging residence group says, we would stress that in our view, the following are factors contributing to the gravity of the position. Number one, the Chris Delphi Magazine Committee's lack of initiative in positively, positively refuting modern trends. We don't think, Brother Sergeant, that you're dealing with this quickly enough. Number two, the Magazine Committee's apparent inclination towards such modern trends as evidenced by the retention on this committee of one whose publication on the origin of man is causing widespread offence. Why is Brother Lovelock still on the committee if you don't support what he says? Number three, the magazine's continued advertising of this publication despite their awareness, we presume, of such offence. Why are you still advertising the notes? In their opinion, if the above factors are allowed to persist, ecclesias will find that despite their goodwill toward the Christadelphian magazine committee, they shall be obliged to withdraw their support from that committee. What is that saying? This ecclesia is saying, if you don't do something about this, we will stop our reading of the Chris Delphia magazine. We will terminate our subscriptions to this magazine. 
Now, you're going to say it's pretty serious in the Brotherhood when Ecclesiastes writes to the editor of the Christian magazine saying, unless you take this in hand, we will, we will terminate our subscriptions. We are the Christadelphians. This is the Christadelphian magazine. Here's a Christadelphian Ecclesia saying, if something doesn't happen, we're going to terminate our subscription to the Christadelphian magazine. All right, what happens next? Well, in August 1965, Brother Louis Sargent wrote a critique then of Ralph Lovelock's notes. And he disagreed with what Brother Lovelock was teaching on the subject. Of, he disagreed with this humanoid nonsense, this pre adamite creation. In fairness, of course, the next, next month, uh, Brother Lovelock, uh, actually it was the previous, yes, August 65, a critique of the notes by Brother Sargent, and September 65, a response to that critique by Brother Lovelock. So Brother Sargent uh, spoke against the notes, and Brother Lovelock clarified his position and tried to defend the notes. You can see all the while, let us the editor, let us the editor. Let us. You've got to believe that in the magazine they're only publishing a small fraction of all the letters that actually get sent to the editor. So letters are, uh, uh, there's a deluge of letters now coming into the editor of the Christopher magazine. In October 1965, people are now starting to write to what the Ecclesia is saying. What are you doing about this brother who's on your AB, who's a responsible brother who believes this error? What for him now got to come out to the magazine to the Ecclesia world and say in October 65, we understand the issue, this has taken us by surprise, we are dealing with it in a reasoned manner. November 65, more letters to the editor, December 1965. The editor writes, in seeking to preserve and strengthen the faith, we hold, while allowing reasonable discussion of current problems and tendencies, the Committee of the Christadelphian Publishing Association has, in the past year, faced a particularly difficult task. So you can see there's a firestorm happening in the Brotherhood here on this issue. In particular, the activities of Brother R.T. Lovelock, independently of the Committee, and for which, therefore, the Committee cannot be held responsible, have provoked widespread criticism. The committee has faced this situation squarely and after long and careful consideration decided it would pave the way to greater harmony and less ambiguity of purpose if Brother Lovelock resigned from the committee. So what we're saying is that in December 1965, Brother Ralph Lovelock resigns from the Christadelphian magazine committee at the request of the committee. All right. What for the Ecclesia? I'm going to now put out a statement saying, where have we got to? Because the Christian world now wants to know, where have Watford got to dealing with this brother on this issue? What is actually happening? Well, they say, we recognise in theory that it is possible to make the words of Scripture mean what Ralph's theory requires them to mean. Although, in our view, not without considerable strain of the verses immediately concerned, and with destructive implications for our attitude to Bible teaching in general. So here's a brother who's gone and taken verses of the Bible and he's twisted them. And the ones that arrange with Brendan are saying, well, it's possible that they could mean what you say, but it's not natural that they should mean what you say. In particular, we've felt that to accept the kind of approach to scriptural interpretation that's involved in Ralph's exposition would be to leave ourselves at the mercy of any other passing wind of doctrine that drew its sanction from a theoretically possible but otherwise unnatural meaning imposed upon a passage of scripture. We could not therefore accept the suggestion that both Ralph's views and the views of our community might be able to live, to live together without destroying the distinctive character of the letter. Ah, uh -uh, what are they saying? It is not acceptable to have people teaching theistic evolution in your ecclesia and just agree to disagree. Not acceptable, says the Watford Arranging Brethren. Why? Because you destroy the distinctive character of the truth. What do they mean? We are satisfied that the end of such a course, if you continue to believe theistic evolution or accept that a verse could say anything that the English language might allow, if you just accept that that's possible, the end of such a course would be the end of us as a community. You destroy the truth. Because nothing could prevent a drift to the churches around us, or for some, a drift to agnosticism. People will leave the, leave the truth and join churches, or, or just become unbelievers. That's where Ralph's theory takes us. 
Time after time, we appeal to Ralph to modify his views, and in a final effort to break the deadlock, we put to him the question, is, Ralph, is your conjectural understanding of the origin of man a uh, worthwhile exchange for the unhappiness apparent in your immediate brethren and the strain produced in your fellowship with them? Do you see what it's done to us, Ralph, they said? Now, we're your best friends. Do you see what it's done to our relationship? Is it worth it for you to disagree with us on these matters like this? Ralph's reply was that the fault lay with our inability to receive new and improved ideas. You're the ones with the problem, brethren, he said. After earnest prayer and much heart searching, the arranging brethren were therefore driven reluctantly to reckon to recommend that our ecclesia withdraw fellowship from Brother Ralph Lovelock. So they, they disfellowship this brother. A serious issue you can see. On the Watford Arranging Brethren at the time were Brother Harry Tennant, who you will have heard of, Brother Cyril Cooper. With John Carter and Cyril Cooper wrote the Cooper Carter Adenum, which is very famous in Australia, solved an atonement problem in Australia. So they were capable brethren, that's the point. Well, what proof from Scripture did Brother Ralph Lovelock have for these ridiculous ideas? Well, here's the first one. So get your Bibles open. Come back to Genesis 4 and 5. Now, why are we talking about this tonight, young people? The reason we're talking about this is because this is an issue in Australia right now. It's an issue in England right now. If it's not an issue in your city, it will become an issue in your city. Not because anybody here might all of a sudden dream this up, but because everyone's got the internet. And whatever's an issue anywhere in the Brotherhood can be on your table in 24 hours. That's the first point. The second point is that what we're seeing in Australia right now is people believing exactly the same thing as Ralph Lovelock believed 50 years ago. Exactly the same thing. That there was a creation of humanoid creatures prior to the existence of Adam and they could breed with Adam and Eve and that we're all descendants of them. That therefore, Adam wasn't the first man. Now how would you prove that from Scripture? Because I think they can prove it from Scripture. Well, here's the first place. Look at this. Genesis chapter 5. So just, I'm going to give you, what I'm going to do here now is, is give you a few arguments and then show you how to answer them. When I say T-E, I mean theistic evolutionists. So theistic evolutionists say that Adam had other children only after Seth was born. So Adam had Cain, Abel, and Seth, and then other children. But Cain, when he was thrown out of the Garden of Eden, he was afraid that people were going to kill him. And in fact, he went out and he took a wife. Where did they come from? And therefore, Cain must have married people who were not descendants of Adam. So, so what are we saying? Well, have a look at this. Genesis 5, verse 4. In the days of Adam, after he'd begotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. So if you just read that verse simply by itself, clearly we've got Cain, Abel, and Seth born. And then other sons and daughters after Seth were born. The problem is, come back to Genesis 4. After Cain kills Abel, Cain is thrown out of the garden before Seth is born. Because you remember, Seth replaced Abel. And when Cain was thrown out of the garden, Genesis 4 verse 15 says that Yahweh said to Cain, Therefore whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold, and Yahweh will set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So who were those people there that were going to kill Cain? First child, Cain. Second child, Abel. Third child, Seth. Then sons and daughters. That's what Genesis 5 said. Cain kills Abel. Abel is replaced by Seth. But before Seth is born, Cain is thrown out of the garden. But there are other people in the world at this time going to kill Cain. And in fact, in verse 17, verse 17 of Genesis 4 says that Cain knew his wife. Cain's married to one of these other people. Who were they? So you see, that, see, you see what these theistic evolutionists are saying? They're saying, ah, there must have been a race of other people in the world before Seth was born. 
that Cain was afraid of, that Cain married, we'll call them the humanoids. They obviously existed, but there's a race of them, there's a number of them. Because wherever Cain goes, he's afraid of them. They must have existed before Adam. How would you answer that? <coughs> you see the question? See the problem? We'll take another look at Genesis 5. Do you know, it's all the way through Genesis 5, you only have sons mentioned. You, you never have any of the daughters. So you've got all these generations, all the way down through, to, for example, to Noah. It's only sons. How would you know if um, Adam didn't have Cain, then Abel, then a few daughters, then Seth? How would you know that? Genesis 5 verse, 5, 5 verse 4 rather simply says, 5 verse 4, that, that Adam begat sons and daughters. It doesn't tell you when he begat those other sons and daughters. There might have been other sons. In fact, there might have gone Cain, Abel, sons and daughters, and then Seth to replace Abel when Abel died. You've got no proof whatsoever about the order that all Adam had his children in. You, you can't make anything out of that. Who do you think Cain actually married? You tell me. I mean, not her name, but who? His sister, of course. And there's no problem from that, with that from Genesis chapter 5. So my answer is every generation in Genesis 5 begins with a son. Daughters are generally not mentioned in genealogies, so there may have been girls in Adam's family prior to Seth. Well, in fact, we think there was. Cain married one of them. Adam, by the way, was 130 years old when he had Seth. It says that in chapter 5, verse 3. But back in Genesis 1, verse 28, he was told to be fruitful and multiply. Are we being asked to believe, if we're being asked to believe that Adam's children went Cain, Abel, Seth, daughter, daughter, son, 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 that he only had three children in 130 years and that was being fruitful and multiplying? I don't think so. But that is what we're being asked to believe, you see. There's a problem there. So you see, what I'm saying to you is, ah, look, I've gone and got Genesis 4 and 5, and I've made it say something, which you look at me and say, well, it's possible to say that, but that's not the natural reading. That's not the most logical answer. You're right. But this is exactly what Brother Lovelock's done. And this is one of his proofs, and this is one of the proofs that the brethren use today who believe theistic evolution. You can see you can knock it over, but it... How do they explain Genesis 1 verse 2? Well, there's a few ways to explain that. Genesis 1 verse 2 says, well, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, the earth was without form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep. So, I, I, mm. Immediately, I can think about three different answers to different questions that you might actually have in mind as you raise this. Some people believe in a young earth and think that in verse 1 it says when God created the heaven and the earth, he actually created the whole world 6,000 years ago. If you believe in a young earth, clearly you can't have people in existence before Adam and that all dating methods are wrong because they give old dates. There are other people, and I'd be one of them, that would say, no, no, this doesn't tell you anything about the age of the earth. When it talks about the heaven and the earth in verse 1 of Genesis 1, the word heaven means in verse 1 what it means in verse 8, sky, and the word earth in verse 1 means what it means in verse 10, ground. And so that when God created the heaven and the earth, I think, I think it means he created the sky and the ground. It doesn't mean he created the whole globe, but the planet may well have...